I named the presentation and tying all if not uh, more or less is the final uh, aim of our project at the University of Malaga just to identify the genes used by the causal agent of uh, this disease, the bacterium Pseudomonas uh, sabastanoi in a woody plant, the olive uh, tree. Uh, the typical symptoms of the disease are in this uh, uh, picture taken from a naturally infected tree in the region of Malaga is the formation of uh, tumors uh, mainly on the stems and the branches and occasionally in uh, very in heavily infected trees. Sometimes you get small tumors on the leaves, but this is very rare and on the fruits, but this is also very rare only when the tree is really heavily infected. Um, this, uh, the causal agent Pseudomonas sabastanoi belong with the, uh, to the so-called the Pseudomonas syringae complex, uh, which is formed by uh, phytopathogenic uh, gram-negative bacteria, which are classified into 10 different species, including more than 50 pathovars. This uh, is not a um, uh, taxonomical uh, uh, name. It is depending basically on the host specificity of the bacteria. Uh, all these bacteria usually contain high molecular weight uh, plasmids, uh, most of them containing uh, virulence factors that I'm going to mention uh, during my talk as well. Uh, model strains of the Pseudomonas syringae uh, complex uh, uh, include uh, mainly uh, bacteria that infect uh, herbaceous plants, like uh, Pseudomonas syringae pathovar syringae, which causes a brown spot of bean, or tomate, pathovar tomato, which causes a brown spot of uh, tomato, and also infects uh, the model plant Arabidopsis, and uh, the pathovar fasciolecula, which uh, produces hello blight on beans. Uh, the, these uh, three pathovars were the first uh, one which a uh, complete genome sequence uh, were published between 2003 and 2005 and of course to work with an herbaceous plant is uh, more simple than working with a woody plant. Uh, mainly if as it is my case uh, you do not have greenhouse facilities at the university. Um, Concerning the species uh, Pseudomonas sabastanoi, the International Committee of Plant Pathogenic Bacteria recognizes uh, um, several pathovars included here. Two of them infecting herbaceous plant, pathovar fasciolicola and pathovar glycinia, which infects uh, soya beans. And the rest of the pathovars infect uh, goody plant, fraxini, neri, uh, retacarpa and sabastanoi, our model system. These three pathovars produces tumors on their respective uh, host. The life cycle of the bacteria is uh, reflected in this uh, um, slide. The bacteria usually lives on the, uh, on the leaves of the plant, epiphytically. During uh, um, temperature, um, during seasons when the humidity is high and the temperatures are not so high, the bacteria penetrate into the tissue through injuries and, uh, and then um, leaves endophytically producing uh, the tumors or the knot formation. Bacterial dispersion usually takes place uh, in rainy seasons and then secondary tumors in the branches are produced. Uh, after uh, checking several strains coming from different countries of the Pathovar Sabastanoi, we choose as a, our model strain an isolate um, coming from France. It was isolated in 1984 is uh, um, pathogenic and virulent in uh, goody olive plants and it contains three plasmids, high molecular weight plasmids. On a gel, originally we thought that uh, this strain contained only two plasmids, but uh, we have finished the sequencing now of these three plasmids and uh, on, on a gel, they, these two, which size are very similar, as you can see here, cannot be differentiated. As a model system, we have developed the growth of uh, in vitro uh, grown olive plants, 
which is more simple to work with uh, on, on the laboratory. The strain we have chosen actually produces uh, uh, on in vitro olive plants the same symptoms uh, that you can see on nature on the natural uh, grown olive plants. You see here the development of the disease several days after inoculation. In uh, 28 days uh, we have uh, the tumor developed that after with the time the tumor get a, a, a necrosis on the outside area. Labeling the bacteria with the plasmid expressing constitutively the GFP protein, we can also follow uh, to, we can follow the dispersion of the of the pathogen on the plant. Uh, you can see here at the beginning is restricted to the inoculation area. We usually take off a leaf on, on the injury that uh, is produced uh, by removing that leaf. Uh, we inoculate the bacteria there and then you see uh, with the time the bacteria is getting dispersed and uh, invade the whole tumor area. Here the GFP is not uh, easily seen by epifluorescent microscopy because of the uh, dark uh, size of the tissue outside. Uh, what we did was also to, at the beginning of this project, it was also to see whether the tumor does its form in the in vitro micro, micro propagated olive plant, it have the same structure of, as uh, the one of uh, adult olive plants. Uh, here we have a cross section of the tumor taking a 35 dpi stained with toluidine blue and you can see here how the hyperplastic tissue is formed that uh, in more detail the internal cavities are described for uh, tumors uh, producing adult uh, olive plants are similar and the bacteria are invading this tissue. Also with a different staining we could also see how the newly formed uh, silent vessels are also formed on these plants. Uh, probably is, this is the way um, Th mm, this is the way the bacteria get fits inside the tumor. Uh, using the GFP tag bacteria, we can also see how the bacteria is not only invading the internal cavities, but it's also getting dispersed to the epidermal uh, part of the tumor, getting outside. And we believe this uh, probably has something to do with the dispersion. The bacteria probably gets out of the tumor and that can, it can be dispersed to other sides of the plant or to other plants just uh, by the rain or insects perhaps. Uh, by scanning confocal laser microscopy we could see in more details how the bacteria is actually invading the apoplast of, uh, of the tumor and is forming structures that probably uh, we thought were biofilms and we actually uh, confirmed that by transmission electron microscopy, uh, as uh, these two pictures here. Here you can see a thick layer of the bacteria that are invading the internal tissue that is uh, completely collapsed uh, by the effect of the bacterium. Or here you have a host cell that it has exploded and then you have the bacteria invading internally this cell or also forming microcolonies uh, in the surroundings. So at this way we have the now clear that uh, the model system we are using that is this specific strain on this specific olive variety grown in vitro uh, produces exactly the same symptoms that are produced by a naturally infected uh, olive tree. Uh, as uh, our idea it was to identify new uh, pathogenicity and virulence factors involved in the in disease production. Before that it was published uh, that uh, uh, phytohormones produced by the bacterium are essential for tumor formation. And uh, you have here the biosynthesis of the phytohormone indolacetic acid, an amino acid derivative, indolacetic acid lysine, which a uh, biosynthetic pathway, pathway was already described uh, during the 80s mainly, uh, starting from tryptophan. And later on, cytokinins, uh, which is also in other phytohormones, which is uh, involved in the virulence of the bacteria. Uh, in this case, the biosynthesis of the cytokinins 
are less uh, characterized and only it is known that a gene called the PTZ gene it is essential for uh, the biosynthesis of the cytokinins. Uh, several Italian groups uh, participated in the characterization of these two uh, virulence factors in the past. Later on, also first published by an Italian group, the group of Angelo Sisto, uh, defined as essential for tumor formation the, uh, what is called the type, four secretion, type 3 secretion system. Is the formation of a syringe from the bacteria, this is the bacterial membrane, that is synthesized as syringe injecting protein effectors to the plant cells. If uh, one have a mutant that is affected on the biosynthesis of the type 3 secretion system pili, then tumor is not formed. This system is responsible of the infection in a compatible interaction like the Pseudomonas avastanoi olive for tumor formation and in an incompatible interaction, like here you have a tobacco plant, uh, is if you don't have the type 3 secretion system, the incompatible interaction, what is called the uh, hypersensitive reaction, bacteria is restricted to the area where it is inoculate, inoculated and cannot disperse out, is also dependent on this system. Ongoing projects on the, the identification of uh, virulence and pathogenicity factors also include the, the group, the work that uh, Vittorio is doing here relating uh, quorum sensing signals, which are molecules, uh, is a regulation system which is cell density dependent, and also the type 4 secretion system. In other syringe that is produced by the bacteria, very well characterizing agrobacterium tumefaciens related with the transfer of DNA from the bacteria to the plant cell and uh, in the bacteria of the Pseudomonas syringae complex the role of the type 4 secretion system is not very well defined yet and this work uh, together also with some work in quorum sensing regulation is also uh, performed at the moment by the group of Stefania Tegli in Florence. Uh, to approach uh, our main goal, the identification of a uh, new virulence factor, we have been uh, following during the last uh, five, six years several genomic strategies. First of all, it was the construction of a macroarray composed by genes already uh, known to be encoded in plasmid of the Pseudomonas syringae complex. Uh, we published that several years ago and I'm not going to talk about this today. I will rather concentrate on the sequencing and the functional analysis of the three plasmids of our strain, uh, a project that we are doing in collaboration with the group of Jesus Murillo from the University of Navarra in Spain. The genome sequencing of our model strain, where four different Spanish groups and a group from the USA has been involved, and a functional genomic uh, strategy called signature tag mutagenesis that I will describe you in detail that has been the PhD project of a student that finished uh, her PhD last year. Uh, sequencing of the genome, we did it by pyro sequencing 15 times uh, using the GSFLX uh, uh, technology in Germany. Uh, we finished with uh, 547 contigs, with this a lot of contigs. This was done uh, at the end of uh, 2008, uh, beginning of uh, 2009. And now the techniques uh, has been developed so fast that this is already to all the data. So it was uh, a lot more expensive and it took us a lot more time to do the analysis. Uh, but by pair and library assembly, we finished with uh, 112 uh, super contest, giving us a percentage of uh, G plus C similar to other uh, pseudomonas already sequenced. The phylogenetic analysis in comparison with other uh, phytopathogenic bacteria from the pseudomonas syringae complex uh, established that pseudomonas avastanoi here is very close to in other pseudomonas syringae, patobartabasi and also fasciolicola, uh, the, the pathogen infecting uh, being. We did an automatic annotation in collaboration with a group from Spain and a group from Madison and finished with approximately 5,000 
200 uh, predicted uh, coding genes. What is interesting of this analysis is, of course, the comparison with a pathogen of an herbaceous plant. And surprisingly, only 1.4% of the genome, 71 genes, were specific of our bacteria. The rest of the genes were uh, shared with Fasci oligola, infecting being, or Pseudomonas syringae. Of course, this part of the genome is uh, what is one of our hotspots at the moment, to try to define what that makes the difference between Savastano infecting a goody plant and producing tumors instead of infecting the leaf of an herbaceous plant. That is, most of the other models are working on that sense. Uh, among other different genes that I'm not going to get into detail, we are at the moment concentrated on a, a gene, two gene clusters that are involved in the degradation of aromatic compounds. We identify the genes that are already uh, known to be involved in the degradation of anthranilate uh, by a cathecol to Krebs cycle intermediates. Although it's not uh, obvious what could be the role of these genes on the invasion of a goody plant, we believe that probably this pathway is relevant for the degradation of uh, lignin derivative compounds. Uh, the pathway was first defined in a pseudomonas strain from the species Resinoborans, which is not a pathogen, but is also leading in direct contact with, with a goody plant. Uh, at the moment, we have done a comparative analysis with all other uh, draft genome sequences that are on the databases, and every single pseudomonas that is living on a goody plant, it contains this cluster. So there is a student in the lab at the moment uh, making the knockout mutants to see whether tumor formation is relevant for uh, this pathway is relevant for tumor formation. Well, this picture is only to show you that we have seen already using a biochemical assay that the pathway is at least active in this bacteria, at least in part. The brownish color that you see here in this media is probably a consequence of an intermediate of the cathecol pathway. In Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a human pathogen, the pathway is fully active and then uh, you get uh, the final compounds that is gives a yellow color. Interestingly, when we finish uh, the sequencing of the genome, we realized that the pathway for the biosynthesis of the indolacetic acid was duplicated. We have two, um, two genes, two copies of uh, two alleles of the EIM, IIA, in English I always have a problem <laughs> to pronounce it, IAAM gene, this is actually H, M, and L, this is a mistake. Two copies of, of each of them. However, two of them uh, seem to be a pseudogene. We are at the moment uh, investigating uh, this a little bit more in detail. We have amplified uh, the genes by PCR and apparently these uh, two are actually pseudogenes that should not be functional. Uh, of course, uh, we also look for um, possible proteins that could be secreted through the type 3 secretion system, as we knew that this system is essential for pathogenicity. We did that using a bioinformatic strategy, uh, not only looking for homologs, but also designing uh, programs that uh, it would identify the end terminal signal of this uh, protein, which is essential for the translocation. Um, we finished with a collection of 23 homologs, two of them that are contained in a plasmid, and nine new candidates, one of them in a plasmid, that is not shared with any other strain already sequenced. At the moment, we are testing whether these proteins are or not translocated to the type 3 secretion system, but uh, we do not have um, several results yet. yet. At least we know that these two that are uh, plasmid encoded are translocated, so they are really uh, protein effectors. Uh, sequencing of the plasmids reveals, as I said before, the system of these two genes, which are, we have already tested that they are translocated to the plant cell, and we are actually constructing the mutants. And we, we have seen also in this, the mutant affected on this gene, it produces a 
smaller tumor that gets a fast necrosis of the tumor. Other items of interest in these three plasmids are that they all share the same uh, type of replicase, which actually should make the plasmid incompatible in principle. And we are interested on why are these three plasmids maintained if they share the same uh, replication system that it has been reported for a long time ago that incompatibility among plasmids uh, depend on the replicates they have. So we have established a collaboration with a Spanish group in Madrid now to, to know a little bit more about the compatibility of the plasmid and their maintenance in the cells. Uh, also, they have uh, plasmid A, it contains a type 4B secretion system uh, which has been reported uh, to be important for the conjugation of plasmid transfer from one bacteria to another bacteria, or the type 4 uh, A secretion system, which is similar to the agrobacterium tumefaciens. And it is involved on the transfer of DNA to the plant cell, or, to the, or, or is also involved in the translocation of proteins. But it is not known, the role, as I said before, in the Pseudomonas syringae complex. Other genes of interest are, of course, PTZ, the one involved in the biosynthesis of cytokinins that is, involved in, that is encoded in plasmid A. And we have found in other genes that it is probably also involved in the biosynthesis of cytokinins, but we haven't uh, tested that yet. Uh, interestingly, this plasmid contains three copies of, uh, of a very big gene. It has uh, more than eight kilobases and is repeated three times. The role of this gene is, has not been published yet. Uh, it was called before shikimate kinase, but this was a wrong annotation of the gene that uh, has nothing to do with the activity of the shikimate kinase in the biosynthesis of uh, uh, amino acids but we don't know the role of, the, of this big gene yet, but it contains three different copies. And plasmid C contains five genes related with toxin and antitoxin genes, which has been described in other bacteria that avoid uh, losing the plasmid. And that's probably the reason why we have been completely unable to cure this plasmid. So if you want to take the plasmid out of the bacteria, you never recover bacteria without plasmid because the bacteria will be killed by a toxin antitoxin system. Some of these genes are encoded in the chromosome. So if the bacteria lose the plasmid, it's killed by a gene that is encoded on the chromosome and is repressed by a gene encoded on a plasmid. <coughs> Nevertheless, we were able to cure plasmid A, the one containing the gene involved in the biosynthesis of cytokinins, and in a strain not containing A, we could cure B. So we have a strain cure of A and a strain cure of A and B. But we could not cure B alone either. Because if you try to cure B alone, it gets integrated into A. And this construction we have tried several times and this is impossible. Nevertheless, interesting, and at, is, as it was reported before by other groups, if you remove a plasmid containing a gene uh, related with the biosynthesis of cytokinins, tumor is produced, but the size of the tumor is smaller. So it is a gene involved in the virulence of the strain. The phenotype on the strain cure of both plasmid is similar to those of the one cure in plasmid A. In our in vitro system, we can see as well that the tumor is smaller, but interestingly, uh, what you see is a fast necrosis of the tumor as compared with the wild type strain. And today we have some proofs that this is probably related with the plasmid effector that is encoded on plasmid A that has been related with the control of the hypersensitive reaction in other bacteria. But we are working on that at the moment. Uh, nevertheless, the bacteria can invade the tissue and the number of bacteria that you isolate from this tumor is similar to the number of bacteria that you isolate from the wild type strain. Uh, if we make cross sections of the tumors uh, formed by the wild type strain and by the strain Q of plasmid A, the one not producing cytokinins, you can see that actually the internal cavities are still formed 
we have some proof to the, uh, now that I will show you at the end that the formation of these internal cavities is dependent on the type 3 secretion system on these proteins that are se secreted through the through the, from the bacteria to the plant using the syringe. However, the difference are on the formation of the silent vessels. So these are the silent vessels that you see here in more detail forming the wild type. Uh, we, you see here um, a staining in blue, the methylene blue, which is uh, a signal that secondary walls are formed in this silent vessel. However, in the bacteria, when the bacteria is lacking the ability to produce the cytokinins, the silent vessels that are formed in the, tum in the tumor are more immature. And they are, uh, and this is a consequence of not uh, producing the cytokinins. Once that we establish uh, the model system and also uh, perform the sequencing of the genome and of the plasmid, uh, we decided uh, to go to use a functional genomic strategy called signature tag mutagenesis to identify new virulence factors that uh, were not uh, known at the moment. This strategy has been uh, broadly used for the identification of a virulence factor in uh, human uh, bacterial pathogens and uh, has helped uh, to the identification of many new uh, pathogenicity and virulence factor. The strategy is uh, summarized in this slide. You start with a plasmid that contains a mixture of plasmid, each of them containing a different tag. The tag is formed by a sequence of, of 40 nucleotides that is different from one plasmid to another plasmid. But all of these tags are surrounded by a common sequence that you can amplify by PCR using two oligonucleotides P2 and P4 that are uh, represented here. And then right before you have Hindi three sites so that you can cut the tag specifically. What you do is you use this mixture of plasmid. Actually, the tag is contained within a transposon. If you transfer the plasmid to your bacteria, the plasmid will be loose but because it cannot be re replicated in the bacteria you are mutagenizing and then you will get transposition of the transposon in randomly located in the genome or in the plasmid of the, of the strain. And each mutant will contain a complete different tag defined by the different sequence of these 40 nucleotides. So we made a collection of all, almost 5,000 uh, different mutants of our strain. 2.7% of them were auxotroph, as we expected. And then the procedure is as follows. You, uh, we are um, uh, conserving these uh, mutants on ELISA plates, and we inoculate pools of uh, approximately 45 mutants, all together first in synthetic uh, rich media. From here, we inoculate approximately 1,000, 10,000 uh, different uh, bacteria into a plant uh, that we have grown in vitro. If you inoculate at 10 to the 4, after 7 days, the bacteria... Sorry, sorry. Do you grow them separately and then you put them together? Yes, or we, already, grow, already grown? we grow them separately, but okay. then we inoculate all of them together just here. But so you mix them only be, just before inoculation? Just before inoculation. So we keep the ELISA plate because this is very important for the procedure at the end, as you will see now. But we mix them from here, Straight. here, we grow them together, and then we use a mixture of the four. Uh, it's not 10 to the 3 of each mutant no, no, but, but of grow, the mixture. Do the 45 grow together? Do they replicate? We, no, what we do is uh, we grow them independently because then if, if a mutant has the inability is uh, growing slower, then you will it will be uh, not represented. Uh, okay, that's that was your question. Yeah. Okay. If you inoculate a mixture of uh, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, you finish having approximately 500, 1,000 colony forming units of each mutant. All of them will be growing on the plant. And after a week, they have reached a population of approximately 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8. That is, uh, est um, that it actually stayed uh, a month after, while the tumor is formed. At that point, when the tumor is formed, then 
what we do is to isolate DNA from the mixture of the 45 mutants. Here we have represented all of them and we amplify with the oligonucleotides uh, the specific tag that we cut within the three and then we label the, the prof with p P32. We tried with other systems but it didn't work. We had to go back to P32 because uh, other <coughs> system usually uh, that we usually use in southern uh, hybridization analysis it, it were not sensitive enough. We do the same thing but with the bacteria that have grown in the plant. Amplify the tags and then we make what we call the output prof that of course will represent only the survivals. Some of the strains if they are affected on a gene that is essential for growth in the plant uh, will not grow or will die so that the tag, this specific tag, it, it will not be present. And what we do later is we make a, a replica of this mutant colony blot analysis on a membrane. We hybridize with the input prof. Most of the profs with the, will be detected. And I say most of the profs because some profs are not detected in the input and of course this mutant cannot be used. What we do is a comparison. Which uh, tags are present in the input but not in the output? These ones should be those of the mutants that are affected on genes essential for growth on the plant. We finish with a collection of 73 different mutants and we isolated the tag from each of them and sequenced the gene where the transposon was located. So we are looking for a uh, loose of function. Uh, we finish with 58 different genes because many of these mutants have the transposon on the same gene in different places. In some cases, but very few, five cases, we have siblings, so the same mutant that have the transposon exactly on the same place. 31 of them were auxotrophs. In summary, uh, 44 of the genes affected, uh, uh, affected the metabolism of the plant we found five mutants affected in secretion systems. I will go into the, a little bit more of detail later. Five of them affected uh, genes uh, involving cell surface uh, structures. I think I need a little bit more water, sorry. Okay. You check all four mm -hmm. Impulse of 45. And we did it twice. So the mutants enters in pool of 45s. You, we got a collection of, the, of candidates that were about 300 on the first round. And with this 300 mixed with the, the wild type and with the other mutants, we make a second round just to be sure that uh, they were not false positive. That sometimes, depending on the mixture, a specific mixture, one mutant can be detected or not. So to avoid that, we make two different rounds. I say we, but it was only one student who did that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you the picture later because she's a really hard worker. It has been her PhD work and she's the one who did the two rounds, the sequencing and the analysis that I will show you now. And also part of the genome analysis. I'm so sad that she's going to leave soon, <laughs> the group, as usually. Uh, we also found five genes that are related in stress tolerance. Uh, as Vittorio is interrupting me, you can all do that. And it's, I'm, I'm used to teach at the university, so you can just stop me at any time. It's perfect. A seven hypothetical protein and genes involved in other functions like chemiotasis, the biosynthesis of indolacetic acid. That is, this was also uh, actually validating our system because it was something that we knew that it was relevant, so it had to, to be uh, show up uh, by the system. And some transcriptional regulators. And, and this is part of, of the work of, uh, of, the, of the newcomers that are here. The work I have shown you has been mainly done by two PhD students that are not uh, with us any longer, Isabel Perez and Luis Rodriguez, and two postdocs that were with us just for six months or, or, or one year. And the group at the moment is uh, composed by these four girls. Isabel Matas is the one who has done the signature tag mutagenesis analysis, 
and Isabel Aragón and Pilar uh, started the PhD last year, and this is a postdoc that started with us a few months ago. As you can see, there is a preference in my group for Isabel. This is Isabel the third. So if there is any Isabella in the group who would be interested on joining our group, I would say that it would have a, a big chance of being accepted. <laughs> they are the real responsible of what I have been talking about. And of course, our network of collaborations, uh, because uh, we are, uh, as uh, Vittorio mentioned before, uh, our expertise is more directed to bacterial uh, molecular genetics, but for the bioinformatic analysis and the genome sequences, we have come with a lot of, a lot of groups from Spain and the USA. We have also a collaboration with Stefania for the type 3 secretion system, for the macroarrays with George Sanding at the University of Michigan, for the microscopy with the cellular biology group from the University of Malaga, micropropagation of olive plants is done in another center in Malaga, etc., etc. And uh, thank you very much uh, to all of them and all of you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer the questions if you have any.